Lord our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have sent your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the adventure. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them a little more than God, and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, both sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name. The word of the Lord. The second lesson is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever they would call every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the cattle, and to the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a partner, and there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and as he slept, then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with the flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made it to a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is this at last is the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called the woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. <laughs> the word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel affirmation. Kelly's had some family 
family concerns that took them away from church, and uh, so we wanted to take this time uh, to present McCain's uh, three-year-old Bible to him. So, here is your Bible. McCain is Tanya and Jeff Kelly's son, and so that is your, that's a heavy Bible, isn't it, right? <laughs> so, uh, that is your Bible, and we just want to bless you as you uh, uh, you page through those pictures and as your mom and dad help you read, read God's Word. So let's, uh, let's give uh, <laughs> Well, I'm wondering uh, how you heard the Gospel text for this morning. And in hearing that, uh, not only what you heard, but uh, maybe how the Gospel made you feel. It's not an easy text, for sure, and I don't know if it was painful to hear Jesus say what he does say about divorce and, and remarriage. I imagine that it had some effect on you when you heard these words of Jesus this morning. When we uh, think about marriage, of course, we celebrate that marriage, and, and 40 years of marriage this morning to uh, Dale and Deb Rework, so uh, they're here with uh, their family, so congratulations to you, and, and to have uh, those times in our lives that we can uh, celebrate long marriages, we, we, cel we celebrate that, of course. Um, I think there are um, many reactions that we have uh, to this text in in the room, and, and sometimes we hear things in the Bible, and I imagine many of us uh, tend to think, well, that was a long time ago when the Bible was written, and nobody really thinks that way. Uh, nobody uh, thinks that way today. And, and perhaps that is true, but what I know for sure is that over the years, Jesus' words about divorce have kept people in bad marriages. Because of these words of Jesus, people have stayed in bad marriages, marriages in which they should have left. But they didn't because of this passage. God doesn't allow for a divorce, they think. But I also know that in the past, people have not been allowed in the church because they were divorced. Or they were looked down upon from members of the church because they were divorced. And as a result, many not only left the church, but many have left the faith because of this as well. So there is no doubt that this has caused a lot of pain for people. And that has been used, these words of Jesus, as a sword to condemn certain people. And so though we can't skip over the text, or else we kind of run the risk of continuing to inflict pain on others. I'm willing to bet that everyone in this room has been impacted by divorce in one way or another. Whether you yourself have been divorced, or your parents, or maybe a, a sibling, or a friend's parents. Divorce has impacted us all. So let me begin by saying that I speak cautiously this morning because of how sensitive I know that the subject matter of divorce can be. And I also know how sensitive the subject matter of just talking about our sexuality can be. But I argue that if it is true that churches don't talk much about sexuality, if churches, churches don't talk much about intimacy in our intimate lives, then my argument is that we're the only one. We are the only ones. Because I defy you to make it through a night of television without watching people in bed or to listen to conversations or look at a magazine or advertisement without finding sexually explicit material. It is everywhere around us, in our culture, 
And so if we don't talk about it in our congregations, if we don't talk about it in our churches, then we are missing something great. Now, I don't believe that most of us are obsessed with sex as, uh, you know, Hollywood sitcoms or movies or commercials think we are. I think that we struggle with a lot heavier issues in our life, and, and the greater issues that we struggle with, the more paramount issues, are usually ones that do not have to do with sex at all. We worry much more about our health. We worry much more about our families or finding a sense of fulfillment in, in our life or, or our fears for and about the future and about our children and finding good friends in this life to share in. But still the Bible makes it clear that while we are not consumed by sexuality or intimacy, the reality is, is that we are created as sexual beings. We are created to be intimate beings. And that is why our church needs to be talking about this topic of sexuality and intimacy as well. Because it is a matter of faith, and it is a matter of holiness. God did not create a soul and then kind of wrap a body around it. He created you as a body, and then He brought your body to life by giving it a soul. This means that the soul and the body are intricately related. You cannot pull them apart. This means that the yearning that you have from your body, and that includes your sexual yearnings, it means that those were created. Male and female, God created them. This is what Jesus reminds us of this morning in, in Holy Scripture. Male and female, God created us. That we are supposed to have our sexual yearnings. They're supposed to be there. They are part of God's good creation. So in becoming one flesh with another person, we make a holy covenant that unites not only our bodies, but it unites our souls as well. And it unites us in such a way that it expresses God's covenantal union with each and every one of us. That is why this holy act can never be reduced to just fulfilling bodily needs, or even to just mean to take away our loneliness. And this is why sex without love does nothing for loneliness except make it worse. So when you engage in intimacy, you are not just touching someone else's body, you are touching their soul. This is how the Bible, the Bible understands sexuality and intimacy. That you are touching their soul, and that is why there is so much hurt and guilt tied up with sex when it is done outside a committed relationship. It is because we have lost the holiness of the act. And because we didn't realize people were putting their hands on our souls. So with this understanding, we can see Jesus' protection of marriage as him. <coughs> We can see how Jesus says the things that Jesus says about marriage and about divorce. Because marriage is the most intimate of all relationships. So this is the place for us to start to talk about marriage and divorce in the Bible. Marriage and divorce are not the same in the Bible as they are today. Do any of you know how women were viewed in biblical times. Well, they were viewed as property. They were simply viewed as property. 
we do not share in those same beliefs today, do we? No, we don't look. We don't look at wives as being property, right? Keith, right? <laughs> All right. Well, good. I'm glad we're clear. We're clear on that. But in a lot of times, that's what they were. When you when you acquire a wife, you acquire property. For a man to marry a woman, there was to be an exchange of property between the woman's father, who owned her, and the man who was going to marry her. And so you remember the story of Jacob in the Old Testament. We know that Jacob loved Rachel, right? So, in order for Jacob to marry Rachel, he had to work for Rachel's father for seven years. Why? Because it was an exchange of property. And then when those seven years were up, Rachel's father gives Jacob Rachel's sister, Leah. Do you remember that story? <laughs> so after seven years, Jacob was able to marry Leah. But Jacob loved Rachel. And so Jacob had to work another seven years in order to marry Rachel. Does that sound anything like marriage today? No, but we have remnants of it. We do have remnants of it today in our traditional wedding ceremony. A father, how many of you brides were walked down the aisle by your father? Just raise your hand. How many of you brides walk down the aisle with your father? Virgil, you walk down the aisle as a bride? Virgil's not paying attention. Did I ask the right question? Oh, all right. And why do you walk down the aisle traditionally with your father? Because your father gives you away, right? Your father gives you away. And what side does your father stand on? Well, he stands on the right side so that he can keep his right hand free, just in case he needs to protect his property. Have you ever wondered about that? That's why. To keep the right hand free to protect his property. So marriage was very different in the Bible because women didn't have any rights. They were property, and because they were property, the man is the one who had the power to divorce. Not the woman, only the man. So notice the Pharisees' question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And the Pharisee asks Jesus a simple yes or no question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And the simple answer is yes, it is legal. Moses says it's Legal, Moses said so, but you see, Jesus doesn't want this question to be a legal question. He wants it to be a relational question. Because that's what our sexuality, that's what intimacy is always about. It is about relations. It is about developing strong relations. So Jesus is lifting the woman out of the status of just being property to be the status of a person with rights. So Jesus wants to take divorce out of the legal realm, outside of a property transaction, to make it relational. He wants to convey the seriousness of it. That it is something that impacts two people, not just one person, but two people. And that it impacts families. And that it impacts communities. And that it impacts churches. It impacts everyone every time a marriage ends in divorce. Because it isn't just simply breaking a legal contract. It is breaking people's hearts. And it is breaking the very heart of God because of the damage it does to communities and families and children. Now I believe that there are times when divorce is necessary, and that divorce is best for everyone who is involved. Especially if those relationships are life-taking and not life-giving.
given. Jesus would not want anyone to be in a relationship that is not giving life. So I think that, especially in cases of abuse, it is not anyone's wish to be in that type of relationship, especially not God's wish, because of how painful those relationships can be, and God certainly does not wish us to be in pain. Sometimes divorce is necessary. Yes, divorce breaks God's heart because it shatters community. But this does not mean that God doesn't have compassion and care for those who are going through divorce. Because ultimately, God is the one that redeems. God is the one that heals. God is the one that puts families back together. God is the one that creates new families out of broken relationships. Putting broken things back together, that is what God does best. So these texts are not just about us, but these texts are about God and God's intentions for us in this life. Did you hear Jesus' words? Let the little children come to me and do not stop them. For it is such to these that the kingdom of God belongs. You are God's child. You are all God's children, and each of us, each of us needs to be touched by this Jesus. All of us are hurting somehow, some way, whether it's by divorce, or whether it's by illness, or grief, or hopelessness, or for the burdens of life that are wearing us down, the wearing, wearing down of our bodies, and our spirits, and our souls. Each one of us is in need of Christ healing touch, each of us, all of us, and Christ's healing touch comes to us when we bow down to the one who makes us and gives us and restores life, life as God intends us to live, life that is full, life that is rich, life that is free and abundant. Let the little children come to me, do not stop them. The little children, they are you. They are you. Little children, these words are for you. They are words of hope, words of love, words of life for us. For the life of the world, God loves and wants and wills us to be whole. And God wants and God wills for you to be whole as well. Through Jesus who is always and forever.